Well, thanks, everybody. I'm Mary Ann Crow from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Not here to talk about regulation, though. <clears throat> Not specifically. Um, I'm on the, I actually work in the, the payments area of the bank, financial services and payment strategy, so not in the regulatory side, not in the monetary policy side. And so that's why our focus is on payments. And particularly, you know, we, no matter what, the Fed still has the responsibility overall for the safety, security, and efficiency of the U.S. payment system so that we always can, you know, find a niche there to focus on payments in general, even if they're not specific to what the Fed might have direct oversight to, like ACH or wholesale. But anyway, I'm going to continue the discussion that um, Mina and Deb started with the, pay the wallet developments and trying to focus around the, um, on some of the, a little more detail around the underlying technology. So I, I'd like to start off with this slide first, because it kind of just gives you, it pulls everything together in terms of how these things might fit. You know, we always say the, the, the payment system for mobile is fragmented, and it's probably not as fragmented as it, as it might have been five years ago, because you're starting to see some sort of a pattern. So, if you, you know, the outside circle are the various types of wallets, but then, the, you know, the second layer there, the one I'm going to focus on, is kind of showing how they're settling on different, some small number of technology platforms for, for security. And then within that, those are each linked to different technology platforms for running the wallets and then the different channels in the middle. So it just, it just tries to tie it all together to give you a sense of, of what we're talking about. So one of the things that we, we see is more of an issue maybe that even impacts adoption with mobile payments and mobile wallets is the fact that when you look at this slide, there are a lot more points of vulnerability. It doesn't mean that they're all not secure or anything, but you certainly have to if you've got a wallet and you're involved in this process. You have to worry about all these different components and there are more of them than if you just if you have a card payment or you have a check payment or an ACH payment. All of those things are part of this. So, you know, not only do you have the regular transaction, if you've got a wallet, you usually do have to set up an account, you download an app, an app, you've got your physical mobile device instead of a plastic card, or in addition to a plastic card, because you certainly have to use your card to provision your payment account to the wallet, but the mobile device brings some security vulnerabilities as well as some security controls. You've got, in some cases, the information is in the cloud, so now you're dealing with that. The end user or the consumer who should really be in the middle of this circle because all of us know, as consumers ourselves and or have customers, we're probably the biggest problem in this whole security space around mobile because we don't understand what our roles and responsibilities are. And to me, that's one of the biggest issues and the hardest one to control based on different people we've talked to in the industry. But then, you know, you've got the, say you've got the wireless network, you've got the different components, um, the underlying st storage is, uh, or communication, as Deb talked about with NFC and the different flavors. Even authentication. Authentication is a security control, but it's not always done the same way. There are different levels, strong authentication, weak authentication. So you don't have everything consistent in terms of what has to be done. So it just it's a lot of work to make sure you get this right and we're as secure as we can be with the wallets. So the first set of wallets I want to talk about are the pay wallets, and, and these are the ones that we um, have, a, you know, we all call it the underlying component is near field communication. So it's Apple Pay, it's Google or Android Pay, whatever their name is today, and it's Samsung Pay. And so they, together they have some commonalities as far as what makes them what we call a pay wallet. So certainly the underlying use of the EMV tokenization specifications for payment tokenization, which is done in lieu of replacing the payment account number in the transaction is one of the common, the biggest common thing that makes what we call these pay wallets. And then the second thing is that they follow a, a not capital S standard, but a standard or best practice way of doing identity and verification in terms of provisioning the token to the wallet before anybody can make a payment. They all accept the ability to do fingerprint biometrics for authentication or back, you know, backup as a PIN or passcode but the fingerprint is common across all three. And then, they, as I said, they have NFC to um, make sure that we're using this to, in a secure way to transmit this information between the mobile device and, po and point of sale. And NFC itself is not new, and it comes with a lot of very technical, I don't even understand, standards and protocols and specifications that are actually globally set so that that's been around a long time. So when you use that, you're following the same kind of standards there. So I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail as well. <clears throat> But the first thing I want to talk about is one of the components is, to is tokenization, payment tokenization. Now, just as um, a quick aside, this is different than 
tokenization itself isn't new in terms of taking an account number or something and then replacing it with something else that you can't map back to it easily to protect the number. <clears throat> and the merchants and the merchant acquirers have been using their own version of what we call security or acquirer tokenization for many years on the back end. So after the payment has gone through the transaction process with the payment account number in the clear all the way through, on the back end they might tokenize it and then not maintain that payment account number so that if the file gets breached, they're, all, they're not getting the actual data that um, that the fraudsters are looking for. That's very different from a payment token. And so payment tokenization that we're talking about is under EMV Co. It's a, it, it's, it follows a very highly secure structure with some new players that are involved in it. <coughs> the one being is the token requester. And this is the, an authorized entity that has to register to become a token requester through EMV Co. that is going to say, I want you to give me a token uh, I don't want you to store the PAN, I want you to replace it with the token for my customer or for whatever they're doing. And so that could be the mobile wallet provider, it could even be a, a merchant at some point or a card on file system, but they're asking the token service provider to tokenize the account for them. So the token service provider has the, is the bulk of the work in this process. And Basically, their responsibility is to generate and provision pay payment tokens to the customer's mobile wallet prior to being able to make a payment. They also, to do that, they manage what we call a token vault. So it's a centralized system that very highly secure, owned and controlled between the issuer and the token service <coughs> provider, depending on the relationship. And that's where the real payment account numbers are stored and the tokens that are mapped to those are stored in there as well. And, if, if, and right now today, the, the major US card networks are the token service providers. There are a couple of other large entities in, this, in the United States that are in the process, and they may already be done, of certifying to become token service providers in addition to the four networks. But they have to be certified through the card networks and through EMVCO because highly secure, critical area of responsibility. So it's not like you're going to have 100 of these TSPs out there in the United States running around being token vaults. Whoever becomes one will still have to follow the strict requirements of EMVCO and the card networks. I mean, the card networks have been controlling and managing and securing our card numbers in their systems for years. They understand the security and the controls, and so that's the same high level of expectation here. So, so this is what sort of sets the framework for tokenization, the way we are using it in the payments of the wallets today. So the way that it's secured is that the um, token is created, and then it also for the payment process generates a unique dynamic data value called a cryptogram. And so basically those two, the static token plus the cryptogram combined, are what are going to flow through the transaction process uh, from beginning to end. And there's a step in the middle, which I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a minute, that that's not the case. But basically from beginning to end, your payment account number is not exposed, your credit card number is not exposed. And that, di that cryptogram is dynamic, as it says, basically that component that gets added to the token is generated for each transaction. So even if a fraudster were able to break in and get to this number, they'd have a, a static token and a, a cryptogram that's only good for one transaction. So if they tried to use that to buy something else somewhere else, it wouldn't work. Not to mention that the token service provider knows as the transaction goes through the flow and when it's time to send that to the bank, the card issuing bank for authorization, that's when the token service provider detokenizes it and sends the real PAN, but in an encrypted mode, in a secure way, to the issuing bank to say, this is good, are you going to authorize the payment or not? And they know based on that cryptogram whether or not it's being used a second time or it's the, the first time it's being used. So there's, a, a, again, a high, much more detailed level of security around this, but it, it is a very secure process. And that's the point where the cryptogram is authenticating the actual transaction when it goes to the token service provider before it goes on for approval. So another thing that um, is done as, far to, as part of the tokenization process is that the token service provider, when they set these up, they set what they call domain restrictions. And so they're able to say, well, this particular token that's in your wallet, you can use it only at point of sale or point of sale in, in the e-commerce world. You can only use it up to a certain dollar limit, perhaps. Um, it's certain, it's, it could be location centric, or you can only use it at a certain merchant. So all of these things are de determined based on whatever their needs are and what the requirements are, but they have all these options called domain restrictions that add another level of security to the process. 
So, so overall, it, you know, it's because of all this information with the cryptogram as well, it's only valid for one transaction. The token itself is not mathematically reversible. You need to have the keys that are stored separately by the token service provider in order to um, actually get the token detokenized into the real account number. And, and that's why this process is considered very secure. So I mentioned that, you know, that indebted to the, the identity and verification process for provisioning tokens to the wallet. So as a customer, I want to add, a, um, I'll use Apple Pay as an example, I want to add my Visa card to Apple Pay. So I would open up the, you know, the Apple wallet and the app, and, and the app ID for that, and then Apple Pay would have to contact the token service provider, because now Apple Pay would be the token requester in this case. They contact the token service provider to request permission from the issuing bank to say, will you add this card number to the wallet? And so this is when the issuer steps in and, say, and does the identity and verification, because they're the one that are going to have the liability if there's any problem with this um, card getting into the wallet. So they, they go through an authentication process, and they might well, thanks, everybody. I'm Mary Ann Crow from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Not here to talk about regulation, though. <clears throat> Not specifically. Um, I'm on the, I actually work in the, the payments area of the bank, financial services and payment strategies, so not in the regulatory side, not in the monetary policy side. And so that's why our focus is on payments. And particularly, you know, we, no matter what, the Fed still has the responsibility overall for the safety, security, and efficiency of the U.S. payment system so that we always can, you know, find a niche there to focus on payments in general, even if they're not specific to what the Fed might have direct oversight to, like ACH or wholesale. But anyway, I'm going to continue the discussion that um, Mina and Deb started with the, pay the wallet developments and trying to focus around the, um, on some of the, a little more detail around the underlying technology. So I, I like to start off with this slide first because it kind of just gives you it pulls everything together in terms of how these things might fit. You know, we always say the, the, the payment system for mobile is fragmented, and it's probably not as fragmented as it, as it might have been five years ago, because you're starting to see some sort of a pattern. So, if you, you know, the outside circle are the various types of wallets, but then, the, you know, the second layer there, the one I'm going to focus on, is kind of showing how they're settling on different, some small number of technology platforms for, for security. And then within that, those are each linked to different technology platforms for running the wallets, and then the different channels in the middle. So it just, it just tries to tie it all together to give you a sense of, of what we're talking about. So one of the things that we, we see is more of an issue maybe that even impacts adoption with mobile payments and mobile wallets is the fact that when you look at this slide, there are a lot more points of vulnerability. It doesn't mean that they're all not secure or anything, but you certainly have to if you've got a wallet and you're involved in this process. You have to worry about all these different components. And there are more of them than if you just, if you have a card payment or you have a check payment or an ACH payment. All of those things are part of this. So, you know, not only do you have the regular transaction, if you've got a wallet, you usually do have to set up an account, you download an app, an app. you've got your physical mobile device instead of a plastic card, or in addition to a plastic card, because you certainly have to use your card to provision your payment account to the wallet. But the mobile device brings some security vulnerabilities as well as some security controls. You've got in some cases the information is in the cloud, so now you're dealing with that. The end user or the consumer who should really be in the middle of this circle because all of us know as consumers ourselves and or have customers, we're probably the biggest problem in this whole security space around mobile because we don't understand what our roles and responsibilities are. And to me that's one of the biggest issues and the hardest one to control based on different people we've talked to in the industry. But then, you know, you've got the, say you've got the wireless network, you've got the different components, um, the underlying s storage as, uh, or communication, as Deb talked about with NFC and the different flavors. Even authentication. Authentication is a security control, but it's not always done the same way. There are different levels, strong authentication, weak authentication. So you don't have everything consistent in terms of what has to be done. So it just it's a lot of work to make sure you get this right and we're as secure as we can be with the wallets. So the first set of wallets I want to talk about are the pay wallets, and, and these are the ones that we um, have, you know, we all call the 
underlying component is near field communication. So it's Apple Pay, it's Google or Android Pay, whatever their name is today, and it's Samsung Pay. And so they together they have some commonalities as far as what makes them what we call a pay wallet. So certainly the underlying use of the EMV tokenization specifications for payment tokenization, which is done in lieu of replacing the payment account number in the transaction is one of the common, the biggest common thing that makes what we call these pay wallets. And then the second thing is that they follow a, a not capital S standard, but a standard or best practice way of doing identity and verification in terms of provisioning the token to the wallet before anybody can make a payment. They all accept the ability to do fingerprint biometrics for authentication or back, you know, backup as a PIN or passcode, but the fingerprint is common across all three. And then, they, as I said, they have NFC to um, make sure that we're using this to, in a secure way to transmit this information between the mobile device and, po and point of sale. And NFC itself is not new, and it comes with a lot of very technical, I don't even understand, standards and protocols and specifications that are actually globally set, so that that's been around a long time. So when you use that, you're following the same kind of standards there. So I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail as well. <clears throat> But the first thing I want to talk about is one of the components is, to is tokenization, payment tokenization. Now, just as um, a quick aside, this is different than tokenization itself isn't new in terms of taking an account number or something and then replacing it with something else that you can't map back to it easily to protect the number. <clears throat> and the merchants and the merchant acquirers have been using their own version of what we call security or acquirer tokenization for many years on the back end. So after the payment has gone through the transaction process with the payment account number in the clear all the way through. On the back end, they might tokenize it and then not maintain that payment account number so that if the file gets breached, they're, all, they're not getting the actual data that, um, that the fraudsters are looking for. That's very different from a payment token. And so payment tokenization that we're talking about is under EMV Co. It's a, it, it's, it falls a very highly secure structure with some new players that are involved in it. The one being is the token requester, and this is the, an authorized entity that has to register to become a token requester through EMV Co. that is going to say, I want you to give me a token. Uh, I don't want you to store the PIN. I want you to replace it with a token for my customer or for whatever they're doing. And so that could be the mobile wallet provider. It could even be a, a merchant at some point or a card on file system. But they're asking the token service provider to tokenize the account for them. So the token service provider has the, is the bulk of the work in this process, and basically their responsibility is to generate and provision pay payment tokens to the customer's mobile wallet prior to being able to make a payment. They also, to do that, they manage what we call a token vault. So it's a centralized system that very highly secure, owned and controlled between the issuer and the token service <coughs> provider, depending on the relationship. And that's where the real payment account numbers are stored and the tokens that are mapped to those are stored in there as well. And, if, if, and right now today, the, the major US card networks are the token service providers. There are a couple of other large entities in, this, in the United States that are in the process, and they may already be done, of certifying to become token service providers in addition to the four networks. But they have to be certified through the card networks and through Invico because highly secure, critical area of responsibility. So it's not like you're going to have 100 of these TSPs out there in the United States running around being token vaults. Whoever becomes one will still have to follow the strict requirements of EMV Co. and the card networks. I mean, the card networks have been controlling and managing and securing our card numbers and their systems for years. They understand the security and the controls, and so that's the same high level of expectation here. So, so this is what sort of sets the framework for tokenization, the way we are using it in the payments of the wallets today. So the way that it's secured is that the um, token is created, and then it also, for the payment process, generates a unique dynamic data value called a cryptogram. And so basically those two the static token plus the cryptogram combined are what are going to flow through the transaction process uh, from beginning to end. And there's a step in the middle, which I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a minute, that that's not the case. But basically, from beginning to end, your payment account number is not exposed. Your credit card number is not exposed. And that, di that cryptogram is dynamic, as it says. Basically, that component that gets added to the token is generated for each transaction. So even if a fraudster were able to break in and get to this number, 
they'd have a, a static token and a, a cryptogram that's only good for one transaction. So if they tried to use that to buy something else somewhere else, it wouldn't work. Not to mention that the token service provider knows as the transaction goes through the flow and when it's time to send that to the bank, the card issuing bank for authorization, that's when the token service provider detokenizes it and sends the real PAN, but in an encrypted mode, in a secure way, to the issuing bank to say, this is good, are you going to authorize the payment or not? And they know based on that cryptogram whether or not it's being used a second time or it's the, the first time it's being used. So there's, a, a, again, a high, much more detailed level of security around this, but it, it is a very secure process. And that's the point where the cryptogram is authenticating the actual transaction when it goes to the token service provider before it goes on for approval. So another thing that um, is done as, far of, as part of the tokenization process is that the token service provider, when they set these up, they set what they call domain restrictions. And so they're able to say, well, this particular token that's in your wallet, you can use it only at point of sale or point of sale in, in the e-commerce world. You can only use it up to a certain dollar limit, perhaps. Um, it, certain, it's, it could be location centric, or you can only use it at a certain merchant. So all of these things are de determined based on whatever their needs are and what the requirements are, but they have all these options called domain restrictions that add another level of security to the process. So, so overall, it, you know, it's because of all this information with the cryptogram as well, it's only valid for one transaction. The token itself is not mathematically reversible. You need to have the keys that are stored separately by the token service provider in order to um, actually get the token detokenized into the real account number. And, and that's why this process is considered very secure. So I mentioned that, you know, that and Deb to, to the, the identity and verification process for provisioning tokens to the wallet. So as a customer, I want to add, a, um, I'll use Apple Pay as an example, I want to add my Visa card to Apple Pay. So I would open up the, you know, the Apple wallet and the app, and, and the app ID for that, and then Apple Pay would have to contact the token service provider, because now Apple Pay would be the token requester in this case. They contact the token service provider to request permission from the issuing bank to say, will you add this card number to the wallet? And so this is when the issuer steps in and, say, and does the identity and verification because they're the one that are going to have the liability if there's any problem with this um, card getting into the wallet. So they, they go through an authentication process and they might receive some data from Apple that, that, that talks about the, either the device ID or something about the user. Maybe the user has an iTunes account that can give some other information to help the issuer make their decision. The issuer is also doing their own risk management provisioning or, or, or review to determine is this a good account, is this really the person that owns this card before I let this card go into this person's wallet. So they go through all this identity verification process and they come up with a risk score and a token assurance level which says this is the confidence, am I 80% confident, 20% confident, whatever, that this is a good account and this is the real customer so that I'm going to let you provision this token to the wallet. And so assuming they approve that, then you know they will send the real payment account number, card number, to the token service provider. Again, that number is encrypted, securely processed to the token service provider. And they will use that to put it in the vault, generate the token, and put the token into the mobile wallet. And all that's done before anybody can make a particular, any kind of a payment using one of those pay wallets. Now, if they have a problem with that, or some suspicion when they're doing the provisioning and review, they can go to what we used to call a step-up level or a yellow level of um, review or provisioning. And this goes back to Deb's point about when Apple Pay first started, these um, requests for information were going to the customer service department. And instead of being suspicious and saying, well, they're coming here because there's a problem potentially, they were trying to help the customer. Oh, you know the first letter of the password? Well, maybe it's P. What do you think the letter? Okay. So I mean, this, it was a very short-term problem. And it was um, stopped very quickly because it was a training issue with them so that um, people realize, no, you're going in here because it could be potentially a fraudulent account or a customer. So ask the right questions, don't help with the answers, or in many cases, transfer it to the fraud department if you really need to get some more scrutiny over it. And again, that's only done in a certain percentage where they, the bank didn't feel as so though they really trusted the customer or knew the customer well enough to put them, let them have the token in the wallet. But that, that's the flow there, and so this is a very critical part in terms of having this, if this works, you've got good security as far as the card holder and the card in the wallet. 
So the next step is really to talk about um, where we talked before about the near field communication and how there were three different methods of actually storing and retrieving tokens from the phone in order to use them in a transaction. So this is where the pay wallets break off in terms of differences. And so Apple Pay uses a secure element, Google Pay uses host card emulation, and Samsung Pay uses host card emulation with the trusted execution environment. And these are driven by the fact that they have different operating systems. So Apple Pay clearly, they own the um, secure element, they own the operating system, they own the phone, and that's why they can prevent anybody else using their secure element for non-Apple um, types of, of transactions in their, in their phones. But the one other thing they have in common that I want to mention too is that from a security perspective, that if a phone has been, whether it's iOS or Android, if it's been rooted or jailbroken, they do not permit a wallet, a pay wallet to be loaded into the phone. So if somehow as you, if you try to load um, Apple Pay into, and I forget which is, which is, is it jailbroken, that's the iOS or rooted, whichever one that is for the iOS phone. If you try to put a wallet in there, it knows that the phone's been jailbroken and it will not allow the wallet to be loaded. So you either clean up your phone or you cannot put one of these in there. Another security, so it's protecting from any exposure to malware or other things that could be infected in the phone because of that. So Apple Pay. So Apple Pay stores the payment token in the embedded secure element. Um, as we said before, it's a tamper-resistant chip. It's hardwired in the phone. It's put in the phone when it's manufactured, so you can't pull it out. It's not like a SIM card thing. It's in there permanently, which alone, coming the way it's been controlled and manufactured all the way through to the phone, is a very secure process. So the secure element is going to host the applications and the cryptographic data, like you know the wallet app and the payment credentials, the static token and the keys, in order to be able to make this wallet um, be able to process. The controller is going, to man is going to manage the traffic and the RF signals between the phone and the point of sale terminal to communicate the token and the, the transaction information. And then we mentioned before, you know, the antenna is part of that. So those, those are all part of the whole NFC picture. And this is, it's considered more secure than the others because of the fact that it has this secure embedded chip. The chip itself is, is a secure area within the phone outside of the operating system. So that also adds a level of security. And it makes it unique compared to the other two pay wallets. So the others, you know, Google Pay, when they were trying to do this a few years ago, you know, I don't know who invented host card emulation, but basically they found a way around having the physical, being able to do near field communication transactions with tapping the phone without needing a physical secure element in the phone. So, that's what this host card emulation, it's software in the phone. But because of it being software, if that's all you did, it would be clearly much less secure for wallets. But what they've done in, instead is they have found a different way to handle and manage the tokens. So there's a master key that represents the payment account number, and it's in the cloud. So this is cloud-based tokenization for the um, pay wallet. And what, what that does is once it's set up and provisioned, it's provisioned just like the other wallets. but when it's time to store the token, the master key is in the cloud and it generates a small number of limited use tokens that will be downloaded to the phone when it's ready to be used. And so those are in a secure area of the mobile operating system but not as secure as the secure element. And the fact that there are limited use, they, they're limited based on how many are in there at a time, they're limited based on there's an expiration of, if, of they will expire if they're not used, they can also be limited by dollar limits. So again, there are controls around those limited use keys so that if, a, again, if a fraudster got in there, and it's a big if because it's hard to do it the way this is set up, they might get access to a couple of limited use co tokens, so maybe that limits them to one or two transactions before they got stopped, if in fact they got in there at all. So that's how they've gotten around not having a secure element. It still generates the cryptogram with it so that the key, the, the, with it, just the cryptogram goes through the process with the token in terms of when you're making a payment transaction. So from the customer perspective, they don't know anything different unless they don't have any keys. So basically, whenever the phone is connected to the network, to the cloud, it's going to check and see and it will download more limited use keys as needed. So you could potentially run out, but I would say most people are usually connected to the network at some point with their phones. So technically, it should be transparent to them if, if they're not, you know, if they're trying to use their tokens. 
Um, so the other one other thing though with postcard emulation again because it is still software <coughs> there needs to be some more security around it and this is where they have to use some kind of what they call white box cryptography to be able to make the key that's in the phone you know not not clear not able to understand what it is so that they can't try to reverse engineer it so there's this this white box cryptography is kind of hiding it or masking it in a way that adds another level of security so that's Google Pay. So Samsung Pay, in addition to this, Samsung, and this is, I, I admit, I, I, this is much more complicated and technical, and, um, but basically, it, the trusted execution environment is a combination of hardware and software that Samsung uses to um, protect, the secure, protect the tokens in the phone. And so it's an isolated area. It's not in the main area of the phone. It's not in the operating system. It's another isolated area that they use to protect this information. And similarly, they have to use limited use keys as well. But they can um, keep them on the phone. They can use static tokens. They can use uh, dynamic tokens depending on, I think, depending on the card network. And that might be more in other countries where there's a difference there too. But basically, they're running these applications in another secure area of the phone outside of the operating system. So that makes it more secure than perhaps just plain old host card emulation. But at the same time, it's still not the hard chip that's in the phone that protects it. And it's limited to only certain phones within the Samsung system network as well. So it's not like any phone that, that is in a Samsung phone can, you can download this and use this wallet. And then we talked about, Deb talked about MST, I won't go over that, but that basically is side by side. So if I have a Samsung phone and I go to a terminal that doesn't have, isn't NFC enabled and I know enough, that's the other thing, I have to know this, I know enough that I have this other version called MST on my Samsung phone to sort of tap and pay. I can use that instead, and I can still pay with my phone. And while it, it is, you know, an emulation of a magnetic stripe card, it is tokenized the way the others are. And when we first learned about this, I, I said, is it tokenized? Is it following the EMV token specs? And we did check with the card networks, and they said, yes, it, it, was, it does comply with the tokenization process that's used for these other, the NFC cards as well. So there is that level of security. So now moving um, to the... Oh, I have a different title in mind. Anyway, um, moving to the card not present space as far as security. So, yes. Oh. It's not to me. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so in the card not present space, we have the wallets that Deb talked about earlier, too. And this is becoming more of a concern because we know that as we did the EMV migration shift in this country, so everybody got their chip card, so the fraudsters decided, well, let's move to the card not present space, which we saw in other countries as well. And that's, you know, happening here too. So on top of that, um, card not present volume, transaction volume is growing. More and more people in general, whether they're using their laptops or their phones, are spending more money and buying more on the website on websites or in you know e-commerce as opposed to just a point of sale. So volumes going up, fraud attention to it is going up. We need to make sure we've got tools in, in place to address it as well. And because the person it's card not present, it it certainly is riskier. So um, because of this, we do need enhanced tools to work with it. And tokenization is has been one that's being looked at and being um, applied as well in some of the wallets that are in the card not present space. So the one I want to mention, and this is the slide that, you know, Deb and I both are, are referenced this one, but I want to talk about it just, just for a bit from a security perspective. So the digital wallets, which are from the card networks, and the card networks use tokenization in the pay wallets for point of sale, they have over the past year or so implemented the ability to tokenize these card not present transactions that are in the digital wallets as well. And so if you just look to the right, basically it's this, it, it, this, this, you know, once you get through the card not present digital space to make your transaction to initiate it, the back end is the same. Once it gets through there, it gets to the acquirer and the, um, it's a gateway on the, in the card not present space, but the token is being passed all the way through. You don't, they're never putting in their real account number and then it's being detokenized, passed to the issuer for the approval authorization, and then back and retokenized and back to the, um, 
to the customer for the verification and confirmation. So basically, they've been able to apply the CMV co-payment tokenization in the card not present world for their particular wallets. And maybe that's something that down the road we'll see with other wallets as well. Now, cloud-based wallets, and here when I, when I talk about cloud-based wallets too, I'm thinking of the, real, the large, like Amazon or PayPal or some of the large merchants who have card on file, large systems, and, and do, mo do their mobile wallets, whether it's the you know, generic account for Amazon or a Walmart wallet or something like that. But these companies are very big, and so while they don't have the exact same way of doing what we are calling identity and verification for provisioning the wallets, and getting the cards in and securing them when they're set up the, setting up the accounts, they have their own very large, proprietary, highly secure and robust um, ways of doing security. And they've been doing it long before the pay wallets existed in the case particularly probably of Amazon and PayPal. They, they, they have very strong fraud systems, risk management systems, data, you know, behavioral analytics and other kind of things and artificial intelligence and whatever is out there they, they control that, but it's very proprietary. You don't really know how. They're not going to give the details of what they're doing. But they, they do have very sophisticated processes for managing these things. And so um, in terms of security, well, I can't, don't know, we don't know specifically what they're doing. They, they, they know what they're doing. And so it's rare, you know, with account takeover, as I've got here, is one of the things that becomes an issue, particularly in these cloud wallets, because um, we don't know you know, a fraudster comes in and can get use somebody else's account and set it up, and if you don't have good verification and process to make sure it's the right person, then they could be setting up an account, or they could be using bots and setting up a lot of these accounts and maybe getting a hit on a few before they're done. So um, it's not that there aren't security threats in the card not present space. There are tools that can help, and in some cases there are companies that are already well ahead of that. But the one that I want to talk about a little bit more before I wrap up, is, 3D, is 3DS, 3 Domain Secure. And um, this was referenced a little while ago, too. So this is a, it's a messaging protocol that provides real-time cardholder authentication from the card issuer during an online transaction. Version 1 has been around for many years. It, it, seemed, it, took, it, had, it did get used a lot in other countries. In the United States, it really did not take off well because it had some requirements. First of all, it was knowledge-based authentication. So, you know, what was your mother's maiden name? What card did you have 10 years ago? Some of those things I don't even remember the answers to. So I don't know how they get people to figure them out. But it also required, if you were going to use this, if the merchant was set up and the merchant came on, I mean, and the customer came on, every customer had to be enrolled. And every transaction I made, whether it was high risk or low risk, was going to be interrupted and had to be, you know, authenticated with this knowledge-based kind of process. So a lot of card, card abandonment, customer frustration, even false positives. And the merchants said, this is, you know, we can't use this. It's hurting our business. And so very few of them adopted it in this country. It was also developed before mobile payments came along. So once the mobile payment process got involved and we started to see a lot more volume and, and the ability to do some of this stuff. In the past few years, the EMV Co. working with the card networks has developed a new version, 2.0. And it is in, still in test form now. As someone said earlier, it has not been released yet, at least not in this country. I think it's being tested in some other countries, maybe Australia, but it's not ready. It's not commercially available yet here. The expectation is that it'll be 2019. But there's enough out there in the draft specifications that companies can start looking at that and getting a sense of understanding how it's going to work. But the big difference is it's risk-based authentication. So instead of authenticating every transaction that comes through for every customer, it does behind the scenes verification and risk analysis using data that in the way this one's built, merchants can provide some of the data to the issuer. They can, you know, to have a little more help in terms of making a decision. And only if the risk based on what they score it exceeds a certain level that they've set as far as I consider this a high risk transaction. Are they going to interrupt that transaction and say to the customer, I need more verification? And in that case, yeah, typically it might be out of band, one time password, send it and send it back and if it, it works, it goes through. But the good news is by doing that, they estimate that they probably will only have to interrupt maybe 5% of transactions that would reach that level of needing to have um, another level of security there. So there's a lot more information available. It, it's not interrupting the customer all the time. 
it, it's also it's going to work on mobile app, mobile browser, as well as PC. It only worked on um, PC browsers before. And then you know you've you've got the issuer and the acquirer working together to pass the information and in the um, through the middle piece, which is the card network, to transmit this information back and forth that they need to make the decision. The other thing is that the the merchant gets to say whether or not they think, you know, the issuer may say we need to do this, and the merchant may say, you know what, I know this customer, I'm comfortable with them, you don't have to interrupt them, I'll, it's okay, let the transaction go through. So that's another way to minimize customer friction. And here again, when, similar to the other one, if the merchants sign up for it and there is a fraud, the, the liability goes back to the issuer. So this is, this is good to help with the merchants as well. But obviously it's going to be work to get it implemented and um, go forward with that. And then the last one, QR code, um, different kind of security, but it's certainly from using it in payments with banks and with others, it, it certainly has more security than maybe it did a few years ago. You can, you know, you can use your pass code or your fingerprint for authentication. They have to comply with PCI requirements. There's, some of them are incorporating tokenization, mentioned Chase Pay earlier. Um, not the same kind, but certainly token, I, if, if the QR code is like a token that it's dynamic, then there's some security there too. So there's more work there, and yes, there, the EMV Co. is working on specifications. I think they're still in draft form, or maybe they're out for comment on standardizing sort of the, the business of what the QR code process looks like, the, the two different <coughs> models, the consumer one and the merchant one, so that there's some standardization out there. I'm not sure how much they've got in there yet on security, but definitely they're, they're starting the process to take a look at those. So I think between all of those, you know, th this is the general platforms that are out there, but the point is there are different levels of security needed. There's clearly no one size fits all, we all know that. But that if you look at all these different components, then depending on the wallet and how it's being used and where it's being used, there are security tools out there that, that, that work, and if they're used effectively, can certainly help minimize any risks around the wallets. So that's what I have. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. The latest adoption dates of 3DS in the U.S. I think, as I said, I think it's 2019. I think the expectation is that, that it will be commercially available sometime in 2019. But again, there's documentation out there that people can be looking at to start understanding what, what it can do and, and preparing for it. Other questions? Okay, thank you.